All right, thank you, Adam, for the warm introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody, to day two of jQuery San Diego. So this talk is going to be about JavaScript testing for all. And you're probably wondering what the all part in this is. And um, it's just to introduce you to testing, no matter what your knowledge is. I'm hoping somebody can take anything away from the three sections we're kind of going to go through for JavaScript testing today. So I'm Rashane McBean. Um, that is my Twitter handle, Copacetic Kid. Um, some people sometimes read that as copy paste kid, but it's Kofi said a kid. <laughs> and uh, uh, I tweet there about JavaScript, Ruby, uh, music, random things. So it's not just a developer Twitter feed, it's about me personally as well. And I'm from New York, and I've recently um, started a meetup called Manhattan JS with two other co organizers. And if you're ever in New York, I want you all to come out. It's going to be about technical and non-technical talks from developers in the community. And it's just to really bring back that community feeling back to Manhattan. So today is about JavaScript. And I'm not here to convince you how great JavaScript is. You're already at jQuery conference. Um, or how much you'll end up loving it or falling in love with it. Today, we're really focusing on testing JavaScript in those areas. So the first one is the importance of testing and why you should be doing it, the pros and cons of it, but mostly the pros here today. The second thing we're going to be focusing on is client-side testing. I write a lot of client-side code, and I've come to learn the value of testing that and being assured that it's going to work. And then we're going to be talking about a testing workflow, which will pretty much gauge you and how to incorporate that into your normal development workflow, whatever that may be. So the importance of testing. Whether you're working on an open source project, you're a developer amongst a team of five to 500, or you're just a new developer getting up to speed with a code base, it's really great to have it there, because if your application is large enough and there's enough moving parts, so one coming to the program brand new can kind of get ramped up to speed a little quicker than, say, having a mentor there for you. It's there in plain English, depending on the framework we're using. But the person has a good sense of idea of what is happening in this app. So an app without test. More power to you if you're doing that. Everyone has different circumstances if they're not doing that. But I don't want to be this guy in the middle of the night having to fix something because there were no tests <laughs> and having my friends to help me live um, debug this. It's over time, you're not going to like yourself. And ensuring that there are tests minimizes the chances of you being up at 3 in the morning or working all day on this. So an app will test will leave you a little bit more confident like this kid. You'll be more rest assured of that things are working, you'll know when things are breaking, and you'll know if you broke something that Kelly or Zach wrote six or eight months ago. So the types of testing. There are two main sectors when it comes to testing. So there's TDD, which stands for Test Driven Development, if you're new to testing at all. And what that focuses on is the unit testing, testing the core functionalities of your application kind of in isolation, depending on how your app is set up. And then there's behavior-driven development, also known as BDD. And that is for more integration testing, depending on how large your app may be and all the interactions that are going on. From a higher level, you'll be testing from start to finish as a user approaching your application whether it's working or not. You're ensuring clicks happen, events move, and you're rest assured from a user perspective that your application is working how you want the user to test it. And most of those integration tests these days, depending on what you're doing, involves a web driver using Selenium. I also do a lot of Ruby development, so I use Cucumber and Gherkin, so I write from a user story perspective. As a user, when I come to this page and I click this button, I want the button to change blue. So that is from a higher level integration testing of seeing how your application works to your end user. So today we'll be focusing on client-side code. 
client-side JavaScript testing. And yes, it can be hard. There's typically a lot of logic going on that you might not remember coming back to if it's only you on the application or if there's several of you on the application. But what if I don't know how to test the feature? Depending on how you might write, I'm not sure if you're using a module or everything is scoped into a document.ready function, very procedural. This is just sample code of how some people may write, and then things become tangled and they cannot really test their code because I got it to work this right way. Why would I decouple it to test it to make sure it's still working, right? But the pain of this is if someone comes to ask you, I want to enhance this feature, and this is the only way you've gotten it to work, it's going to be a pain to add to this. You'll most likely just start from scratch and write something similar to this. Whereas if you are writing more testable code, you can extract certain functions and use them piece by piece in other places. You don't have to worry about, I wrote it here to work on this page. Now they want it again to work on this second page. I'm pretty much copying and pasting. If you kind of step back and modulize your code, you can have that one function being called nicely on several pages. But how do I get to that point? You want to use objects. You want your code to be modular and reusable. In JavaScript, we're given object literals is a nice place to start if you're coming from how do I approach writing maintainable code. You have properties on the object. It'll make your code more cleaner. You'll organize your code better. And one nice benefit as you start to look into cleaner code is you're not polluting the global namespace as much by just having variables all within your application or overwriting something, something else someone else may have written. So this is an example of what an um, object literal looks like. I have a function called jQueryCon, and my first function was about San Diego day one and returned a string that we had an awesome time. And today is day two, and I'm returning a string that we heart JavaScript. And then in the last function, I've written something about the entire function that now I can call to these two separate functions doing things that are independent of each other in one place, or I can use them separately depending on what I'm doing. So that was an example of code organization. We're writing less tangible code, and you want to think about code organizations, you kind of want to approach your code from four perspectives. You want to think about the presentation and interaction there may be, any data management or persistence AJAX calls that you might be using, the overall application state of your application, and then setting up and gluing these working pieces together, like how I showed you in the object literal example. So we've kind of gotten to, I'm writing maintainable code in a sense, and now I'm approaching it from Codes, um, testing is important, but how do I actually write the test? Which tool do I use? There are so many options out there. There's QUnit, there's Jasmine, there's Mocha, Sinone, Chai. The list goes on and on depending on for JavaScript and whatever language you might be using on the server side. But today we'll be focusing on Jasmine. And what is Jasmine? Jasmine is a behavior-driven framework for testing your code, and it doesn't depend on any other JavaScript frameworks that I just mentioned. It doesn't require the DOM, like the Selenium web I also mentioned during a behavior-driven approach. And it just makes it clean for you to write code. And the syntax is kind of obvious and approachable to anyone unfamiliar with testing what is going on with your code. Similar in nature, if you have a Ruby background, it will look like our spec as the coming examples come along. And we'll, we'll be describing things in a describe and it block of like, describe this, it does that. So how do I write a test, a Jasmine test in particular? So Jasmine is composed of a few different components that we'll be going through called suites, specs, expectations with matchers and spies. So suites, describe your test. So in this block, we have a describe, and I'm describing the jQueryCon San Diego day two function. That first part of the function is just a string. 
you can use it to describe whatever action may be going on, or the function in this case. And then in the it block is actually describing what it's going to do. So the suites help you organize your test specs, and they can contain other suites inside of them. So the actual spec in here would be the it statement where it should return some text. And your spec, your suite can have any number of specs in them. Depending on how big the function is, it could be describing multiple it blocks within there. But you only want it to be testing that one component of it. Even if the function is calling to other functions, you want to test that separately within your specs. Expectations and matchers. So the expectations are built from the expect function. So here we have the describe block. It's describing a function called hello world, and it says hello world is what it will do. And the expectation, the, the expect function comes from the Jasmine framework. And here I'll be calling to my hello function, which it will actually call to and do. Bef um, this is set up before running any tests. And then the matcher is the contain to part, which will have the expected value. So the matchers are responsible for reporting a Jasmine if something was true or false. In this example, we were just checking if the variable actually equal to 12. So the matcher is on the opposite side of the expect. It's after the parentheses where it says to equal. That is one example of a matcher Jasmine gives you. There are several within the framework, and you can also write your own custom matchers if you find that your application is doing something very unique in repetitive places. So in this example, we have an arbitrary tool spec that I created. And some of the things I'm going to go into more detail, but on a higher level, this spec is defining some functions, some variables on the page. And then inside each describe block, I'm describing every interaction that my tooltip is doing. This goes back to saying that your suites can have multiple specs. So on a higher level, I have a tooltip function. And it does two things inside of it. Depending on the interaction, it will open and close. So here I've written some code for what's happening when I'm interacting with a closed tooltip. So I've described that when I come to this closed tooltip, it should show, it should show the, it should hide the close, it's close. It should show the tooltip area, sorry. So the first part is just me defining where on the page I'm looking for it using jQuery to find that selector on the page, I'm finding the trigger I'm actually going to interact with and click, and then I'm finding the actual area that it's going to be affected by it. So in my function, it takes two parameters. I've extracted out the fact that I need to know what I've clicked and what I'm actually affecting, and then I'm checking the outcome and the expect, where I'm expecting that particular area of the tooltip, in this case, to not be hidden. And Jasmine also provides you with negations of you want it to be something, you want it to not be something. So in this case, I'm checking that the tooltip is not hidden. And the not hidden part, I will get to that more later, but a glimpse ahead is that is from another library where I can actually test interactions on the DOM. So in here, So Jasmine also allows you to check if functions have been called and simulate their behavior. A spy can stub any function and it tracks the arguments. So the spy on this example is the click event equals spy on event that comes from Jasmine. And it's actually checking that when I clicked on the tooltip trigger that that event actually occurred. I'm not necessarily relying on that the user has clicked the right um, selector on the page. I'm actually checking that against Jasmine with the spies. 
And then after that, I'm checking, did this click event actually trigger on the tooltip area? And that I actually expected that that click event did occur with the expect click event to have been triggered. So Jasmine provides a useful set of maintaining readable, a readable test suite and organizing them. So depending on how big your test suite may get for a particular function or the interactions, you may want to start incorporating a before each and after each. So the before each sets up some expectations before I even interact with the functionality here before each um, spec is actually executed. So what happened in time was you may realize that I need to extract things that are repeating multiply in each spec feature and have them execute right before that. So in this instance, I always needed to know where on the page the closed tooltip was and what the area was affecting. So this led to refactoring that out into a before each, so it's already set up before I, before the test, it should trigger the click event actually occurs. And then you have after eaches as well, depending on if you need to clean up something after a test has occurred and you wanna make sure you're coming to the next spec with a clean slate. So nested suites, so I mentioned that briefly before that you can nest multiple things depending on if it makes sense. So you can have things in groups, subgroups, and even subgroups to maintain, to ensure that it's readable and to maintain organization. So as I mentioned before, you can le leverage additional libraries within Jasmine since it's a standalone framework. So some of the additional tools you may need are testing the DOM if you are using jQuery on your page at all for anything, or mocking AJAX events depending on how um, AJAX persistent your app may be. So there is a library called Jasmine jQuery that gives you a custom set of matchers to test the jQuery framework within your application, and then there's an API for also handling HTML, CSS, and JSON fixtures. So some of the matches you get out of the library are checking if something is empty, hidden, has CSS, has been selected. These are just a few of the popular ones that are used. There are many more on the repo if you Google Jasmine jQuery. And this refers back to the examples before where the to be hidden is actually coming from that library. So the HTML fixtures. The HTML fixtures are for you to, to template out your code within the Jasmine test suite. So if you only need to test a table within the page of your application, you would mock that out in a fixture so that you can actually test those interactions within your Jasmine framework. So you usually set that up in its, its own isolated area, and then in order to load the fixtures, the library provides you with a function called those fixtures, and then you store that into a variable within your test, and then you can manipulate that for your test interactions. You also get JSON fixtures, which allow you to load mock JSON data if you're testing anything you might be getting back from a third-party server or your own server if you have an API within it. You can load that up beforehand and use that in your tests instead of mocking them throughout your test. There are also event spies. And this again comes from the jQuery, the Jasmine jQuery library, not from the, the regular framework. I think I lost something. So I'm missing a slide, but I'll add this when I post them. There is also, um, it's called Jasmine Ajax, and that is for you to allow you to mock your Ajax calls if you're dealing with any other, if you're doing a lot of Ajax persistence, that library allows you to create 
fake make-out calls, mock calls, and return sample data and test out scenarios such as if there are successful um, responses coming back, error responses coming back. They're good for ensuring that your AJAX calls are actually related and you'll need that library to do it. So now that we've kind of gone through what Jasmine is and how you can start to incorporate that into your, your application, how do you incorporate this into your development workflow depending on what that might be? And everyone's is different. But what to keep in mind is some loose laws of testing. Depending on your level of testing right now or, or in the future, you want to keep in mind three things when you're doing tests. You want to avoid writing any production code until you've written the failing test. You want to avoid writing more than one test at one time. And then you also want to avoid refactoring before you've written anything good enough to just make that test pass. Because you might get the idea in your head of, oh, I see how the final spot may be, but that may not entirely hold up to your test and, or even to the application to ensure that was working properly. So for local development, whether you're mainly on your laptop or you have monitors and you split screen, I would recommend splitting your text editor, no matter what that may be, and keeping the test on one side and where you're writing the actual production code on the other. So you can start to build a workflow of going from red failing, green passing, and then refactoring if need be. But you never want to refactor areas that are already passing, typically unless you need to work in that area, because then you start to lose sidetrack and you go down a rabbit hole of just over testing, because that does exist. So how can I automate these tasks when I'm working? If you're not in a Ruby environment where you can write rig tasks to have these run, um, I would recommend using Grunt, because that is very standalone, and it doesn't depend on what your server-side frame um, programming language might be. It just runs in I complete isolation, and you'll set it up to configure however your test may be working. Development servers. If you are able to have one and you're not just pushing straight to production, if this is just your own app, not your company's, uh, I would recommend using CircleCI or, or Travis. Um, they're very good for testing your builds. You can also use either one of them in a sense of if you do feature branches through, through GitHub, they run all of your tests there as well before you merge anything into master as long as you configure it to be that way. And then maintainable JavaScript. So to ensure code quality within your app, I recommend using JS Hint and configure that to what are some standard conventions of how to write your JavaScript so it looks clean and it looks like only one person may have written it depending on how big your team may be. And if you're not sure of where to define these standards, uh, uh, JS Hint kind of have some recommendations of how you can configure things. Um, there's also a book by the same title by um, Nicholas Zegas that kind of tells you how to write cleaner code when you're working, especially in larger teams. And then there's also idiomatic JS, and that kind of gives you some standards for how to, for even pick your own standards if you're not working in a team. You kind of want to establish patterns where your code looks consistent from project to project based on what you may like. All right, Thank, I hope I've left you with the urge to swim off into the testing waters. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask me now, or you can also reach out to me later uh, at my Twitter handle, and that is also where you can find me on GitHub as well. <laughs>